Anybody have one of these growing up? This is one of my favorite toys as a kid, the pitchback, right? Throw the ball at it, it comes back to you. You had these for one of two reasons. One, uh, your dad was too busy to play catch, or two, you simply didn't have any friends. I'd like to think my dad was a busy man growing up, but I loved my pitchback, man. I would be out there every day. I remember one time I came up with this, what I thought to be a great idea. I wonder if I took some pool balls from the table downstairs, if I were to throw it real hard at this pitchback, if I could literally get one to go over the house and land in the front yard. Seemed perfectly harmless at the time. The first one landed on the roof, rolled into the down spot. I believe it is still lodged in there to this day. And my second attempt went right through my brother's window. It, it seemed like a harmless idea at the time. Certainly, upon further reflection, not such a good idea. Teaching team sat down several months ago to plan our fall series. We wanted to know what was challenging you, our community, and what difficulty, crisis, what were you facing? So we listed them all out on the board and we found out that a lot of these situations, I mean, they were of no fault of your own. They were accidents, illness, health issues, maybe things that other broken people sort of did to you. But we also found out one thing. In all reality, we found out that a lot of these cases, you admitted that, that it was your own fault. You know, something that maybe appeared to be harmless wasn't. Something that seemed like a good idea at the time wasn't. So join us. We're going to tackle six issues, uh, everything from purity to integrity, over the next six weeks. A and we've entitled this series, My Own Worst Enemy. Our hope is to maybe prevent you from throwing a five ball through your brother's bedroom window. You know, I was probably about seven or eight years old when that pitch back was my best friend. Um, I do not remember much of the incident, but I do remember the conversation and the consequences when dad got home. As a kid, I think, don't we often find ourselves in these sort of, I don't know what I was thinking predicament, right? Have you ever experienced that as a kid? I think all of us, kids, but even as adults, we have a little bit of that maverick spirit in us, right? You know, risk taker, maybe a little playful, adventurous, and on many occasions, that, that's even really quite healthy. You know, I, I think it, it tends to, to help you challenge the status quo. Take a chance. Take a risk from time to time. It can prevent you, that maverick fear, spirit, from even maybe getting stuck in the ordinary. But for me, and I really mean this, because when I was saying this to somebody, they like laughed. No, I mean this. But for me, for the most part, I, I'm a rule follower. Like, like I really am. I, I believe that, you know, speed limits do apply to me. I believe in taking, you know, your own turn in line. I believe in being on time for meetings. I believe when they tell you to show up two hours before your flight, that you ought to show up two hours before your flight. But there are some of you, that you are not rule followers, right? And you know who you are. You know, speed limits are merely suggestions, right? taking your turn in line or for those that are not nearly as busy or as important as you are. And meetings start when you arrive. You know who you are, right? Let me tell you something. This series, it's not about waiting your turn. It's not about being on time. It's not about attempting to squeeze maybe this maverick spirit out of you. We really want to go several levels beneath that. You know, a couple months back, our teaching team was sitting around and we were saying, in the conversations that we're having with people, what are they struggling with? And we literally whiteboarded them, put them up on a wall. What, what are our people? What are the conversations, the coffees? When people are really getting honest with us, what's going on? And a lot of times, again, like in the video that, that I mentioned, it, it's stuff that's sort of out of your control. But another theme really emerged. Often in these conversations, the person was fully aware that they put themselves in the mess, that their predicament was their doing. You know, at, at some point, after being told I was going to pay for the window, 
and receiving a punishment that, that nowadays my dad might be put in jail for, right? I mean, I grew up in those days where when you did something ridiculous like that, you got hit with anything within reach. You know what I mean? If you were in the kitchen, find you're at the spell at the end of a wooden spoon or a rolling pin. If you were outside, it could be a wiffle ball bat or a tree branch, right? I mean, you, anybody grew up in that days? I mean, you do something silly, you, you, you're going to get it. And I, I can remember sort of sitting there in that sort of, as a, as a child, or maybe you've got kids, you know, you're doing that sort of half cry, half talk thing. You know what I mean? You're like, I, I, I don't know why I, I, I did it. You know what I mean? You ever do that? See your kids do that? You know what? As adults, you might not be doing that half cry, half talk thing. But I think often we find ourselves saying, I don't know why. I, I don't know why I did that. I, I don't know what I was thinking. The, the Apostle Paul in, in Romans 7 says this, For I do not understand my own actions. For I, knew, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. We've all been there, right? I, I have no idea. It seemed harmless. You know, I didn't think it would escalate or get this out of control. I, I did not mean to hurt anyone or cause this much damage. During this series, our hope would be a couple things. One, that, that we would maybe cause you to stop and think before you aim your pitch back, you know, at your house. Maybe if you're in the middle of something right now and you've dug yourself into a difficult spot, that we could cause you to turn before you break any more windows. The, the Apostle Paul, I mean, he was a guy that had his act together. The guy that just wrote what he just said there, this is a guy that had an encounter with Jesus Christ and was given a clear work to do, given a mission. And yet he still said, I don't understand why I do what I do sometimes. You know, the teaching team settled on the four most sort of common themes that we heard from you. Integrity, busyness, money, and purity. And then I added two um, things that have sort of been on my heart that I feel like God has placed. Um, so in two weeks, to that list, we're going to talk about criticism. Because I found that some of us have just crushed the relationships, and placed a, a real sort of dark cloud over our heads because of this critical spirit that we have, that we're casting maybe our own insecurities or disappointments on everybody and anyone within earshot. And then today, since it's Labor Day weekend, we wanted to talk about work. Let me just define work for a minute because I want to make sure we're all included in this conversation. So whatever season you're currently in, whatever age you are, there is something that you're doing. You know, you, you may have a job right now in the field that you went to college for or that you studied to be and you're quite satisfied in that job. You, you may be working two part-time jobs right now in order to get yourself set or find the job that you really want. Because of the economy that we are in right now, you may find yourself incredibly underemployed. You might be a student. You might be in the military. You might be a stay-at-home mom or dad in this season. You may be retired and finding yourself volunteering somewhere or doing something with your time. You might be independently wealthy and you're finding yourself having the luxury of being able to pick and choose where you want to work or consult. This may be a labor of love, or it may just be a labor. Not everything in these next moments together today may directly apply to you, but I feel if you hang in there with me, there's gonna be something for you, no matter what you call work or labor in this season that you're in today. You know, I have sat and prayed with many of you over this topic of work. I have heard from those of you that have realized that the pursuit of money or promotions 
have crushed some of your most treasured relationships. Or that in order to get ahead, to accomplish something, to move up the ladder, you've compromised deep convictions. You know, I, I've sat with you and others of you that are just stuck sort of in this endless, you know, circle of bouncing from job to job where, where you're just constantly thinking there's a greener pasture opportunity. There are some of you that you're just in a spot where you are not passionate at all about what you're doing. And therefore, it's caused apathy and maybe less than professionalism in your work. And you're constantly being reprimanded or worse yet, let go. You know, there's some of you that you, you're bringing unhappiness home with you. And you're transferring that disdain or or struggle at work to your spouse or to your kids. I have seen some of you really unexplainably, you come to me and you say, I don't know why. I'm just anger. There's so much anger because I see these other people getting ahead and succeeding. And I'm looking at me in my job, in my work, and what I'm doing, and I'm struggling with it. There are some that... that you know, have to work rather than be home with the kids and, and they're upset about that and there's others that, that are home with the kids and they are resentful because they want to be pursuing a career. Our attitude and our actions about our work and our labor can indeed become our own worst enemy. So before I dig into that, one, one more point for you here on this on this topic. And let me say that this week, this topic of labor and, and work, um, I, I think it's going to be a little bit of a softball compared to where we're headed in coming weeks. Um, it's a holiday weekend, right? So, you know, I've got to take it easy, right? Well, next week um, is purity. And I'm just telling you right now, it's going to be like a 95-mile-an-hour fastball compared to this week. So, so a bonus point here. No matter who you are, you only have two enemies. And some of you like are, are saying, oh, no way, Scott, you don't know my life. Like, you don't know my boss. You don't know Fred down in accounting that, you know, kicks back my expense reports. You don't know I got enemies. No. You, you have, the, the, those folks, they might be nuisances, royal pains, but they're not your enemies. You have two. One is Satan and demonic forces. And two is you. And that's it. And, and I want to tell you about the Satan part of this. I'm not one of those guys that, you know, Satan is behind everything, every door. You know, I don't believe you get up in the middle of the night and you, you know, want to see if there's any cake left in the refrigerator and you go downstairs and, you know, stub your toe. Satan! That's, that's, that's not me. Satan is real. He is evil, and he is out to destroy. And we're going to address that, the reality of that, in this series. But, but I would challenge you that I don't, I don't know that anybody has lied to me or betrayed me or deceived me more than me. I, I believe we are our greatest enemy. And it's what Paul is talking about in, in Romans 7. Satan's already been defeated. The, the blood of the lamb, you know, Jesus ma makes him a, a loser in, in this battle. But, oh, our will, our free will, our stubbornness, our dogged determination to do what we want to do. I'm my, own, I'm my own worst enemy. So bonus point over. We're going to come back to that in this series. So know that that's going to be a theme. So the University of Chicago, it just did this extensive sort of research, you can look it up online, into the connection between happiness and our work, our job. A couple key findings. One, there is no direct connection between how much you make and your happiness. In fact, they found that was almost the opposite 
that a lot of the more higher paying jobs, those folks listed and, and scored on the survey way less happier than some of the lesser paying jobs. Two factors, they said, that create this happiness between what you do at work and, and how happy you are. One, you had some control over the outcomes. I mean, you had some control over the environment where you do your work. And secondly, and please hear me on this, you valued it. Not others, not what others saw it as value, but there was a direct link to your happiness at work if you saw value in what you did. So here's what I want you to do. They ranked all these professions. Turn to the neighbor beside you, seriously, and guess what was the highest percentage of happiness associated with what job? So what jo job scored the highest on this happy meter? Okay, go ahead, seriously, do it. Tell somebody right now. What's your, what's your highest, what do you think the highest one? Take a guess on what profession. Okay, ready? Survey says. I'm not kidding. And when I saw this, I thought to myself, I have to preach on this. Because if I'm the happiness bar standard that you are all trying to striving to live up to, then there's a lot of unhappy people out there because there's a lot of time I'm not happy in what I'm doing. I can assure you of that. If my job is the most happy, I feel sorry for y'all. <laughs> so let's dig into this. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever done anything or experienced something that left you like even thinking to yourself, if I could do that for a living, man, if I could make money doing that, that's what I would do. You ever think that, you know, in some kind of experience or something's going on? Now, I'm not talking about like, you know, I just took a great nap. If I could get paid to take naps, that's what I want to do. I'm talking about something productive, right? Something that left an impact, something that brought value, something that made a difference. Folks, Hear me on this. I believe we should be having more of those feelings no matter what it is that you are doing or that you call work. So I want to try to take us through three sort of what I'd call maybe attitude adjustments that hopefully will help you gain momentum in your work. In the foundational text, there's one you want to memorize on this. It's in your notes, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You, me, were God's workmanship. He crafted you. He crafted me. Our work then, or our labor, and get this, it becomes sort of a second wave of his divine work. God crafted us so that we can then go and do work that he has prepared for us. And I know some of you have just checked out because you're saying, Scott, there is nothing divine about what I do. Hang in there with me because this is what I'm saying. If you can find a way, whether you're a student, no matter what you do, if you can find a way to make work a sacred place, man, I believe God will do something good there through you something he has prepared for you beforehand. Whether it's part-time, whether it's temporary, whether it's something you're setting yourself up to do, whether you're studying, whether you're in a dream job, whether you're working towards that dream, I believe if we can create a sacred place there, God can do something amazing. First Chronicles 28, verse 19. I'll have it up on the screens. It's, it's in your notes. David has been informed by God that he's not going to be able to do the work of building the temple. This unbelievable structure, one of a kind, nothing like it ever built before. David so desperately wanted to build this temple for God, and God said, no, you've got too much blood on your hands. Instead, your son Solomon will build this temple. It says, verse 19, all this he made clear to me in writing from the hand of the Lord, all the work to be done according to the plan. Then David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do it. He's talking about building the temple there. Do not be afraid, or not be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until the work for his service of the house of the Lord is finished. 
And behold, the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the service of the house of the God. And with you in all the work will be every willing man who has skill for any kind of service. Also the officers and the people will be wholly at your command. Two sort of key phrases here I, I want us to grab a hold of. First, at Solomon's disposal will be people that have skill. You know, folks, this is a monumental task that Solomon was about to undertake. This building that, that, was, that, that he had been tasked to construct, there has never been anything before it or since built. It was going to take incredibly skilled workers. Stay with me on this. Have you ever heard this phrase, and it's said a couple different ways sometimes, but maybe it's said like this. If you can dream it, you can do it. Or sometimes it's said, if you're passionate about it, you will succeed. C can I say something real here? I don't think that's true. I think we should stop telling our kids that. Because if you can dream it, you can dream it. But it doesn't mean you can do it. I believe we have been raised in a culture that says if you can dream it, you can do it. And then we want there to be no distance between dreaming and succeeding. We want the dreaming to be immediately followed by the achieving. We want the passion to be followed immediately by succeeding. And folks, there is a huge gap between passion and success, between dreaming and achieving. And please hear me, forward thinking is a, is a, is a great thing. It's a good thing, but it cannot be the only thing. We've got to shift our dreaming and our passion into discipline. You, you know, what, what does David say to Solomon in the beginning of this text? Be strong and courageous and do it. The NIV says there, be strong and courageous and do the work, it says. You know, in Scripture, when you hear this word, be strong and be courageous, isn't it awfully often like associated with taking on a giant with a slingshot and a couple rocks? Be strong and courageous. Isn't it often referred to like, you know, you're going to go take on the Pharaoh. You're going to go challenge the Pharaoh, and all you've got is a stick. You know what be strong and courageous is here? Build a building. It's not about Goliath. It's not about a Pharaoh. It's about building a building. If work is going to become a sacred space for you, folks, we have to be disciplined. And you have to go at it with strength and courage each day. I believe David is telling his son here, work is hard. It's hard. But don't be afraid or dismayed. There's going to be good days and bad days on this project, but God is with you. He will not forsake you. For, for many of us, I just think we want our passions and dreams to be valued and respected, but we don't want to go through the discipline of the hard work to get there. We live, I think, sometimes in this mythology, the greatness. It comes easy. We, we, you know, we find ourselves catching ourselves either saying this out loud or in our mind. Like, you know, people, they, they just... They don't get me at my job. They don't, they don't get me. You know, I could do this in my sleep. I'm way too talented for this. You know, talent does not equal skill. David said that in that text that, that he was going to gather people that are willing, that had passion, but also that said that they had skill. He didn't say he was just going to go get the best Talent. If you do not go through the difficult process of hard work and discipline, I don't believe your passion and your talent will become skill. And I don't know that your work will become a sacred place. You know, if I needed brain surgery, I would choose a skilled brain surgeon, not a passionate or talented brain surgeon. 
If you had to pick between two guys, and one guy comes up to you and says, man, I am just fired up about brain surgery. I mean, I just love the thoughts of it. Cutting people's heads off and then digging around in there. Man, I am so excited about that. Hey, I have some of the best hand-eye coordination, they tell me, that ever went to this school. And every single test I took told me this is what I should do. Do you want that guy? Or do you want the guy that went through school, finished top, worked hard, said that he ever, before he ever picked up a scalpel, he observed countless hours of the most cutting edge procedures, that he'd been working hard at this for 20 years and has been very successful. Who are you picking? Matthew 5.5 5 says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What does the word meek mean to you? When you think of the word or hear the word meek, what do you think? I think often what we immediately think is weak. Come on. Do you? You think meek, it means like, oh, it's like wimpy. You know, when's the last time? So let's say the Steelers, you know, just crushed the Broncos next Sunday night. You're going to come to work and you're going to say, man, those Steelers last night, they were meek. You're not going to say that. Well, you know, you pull up beside a hot rod at a red light. I mean, engine hanging out of the car, it's rumbling like a rocket, big fat tires. You know, like, you're like, meek. We, we don't think of the word. We, we, we often associate it with weakness. Do, do you know what the word really means? It means controlled strength. And it's closely associated with training horses. It literally means when you take a wild and powerful stallion and you train it to be ridden, then it has become meek, it says. But folks, hear me on that. This horse is still just as powerful and just as strong. But now its power and its passion have been focused and disciplined so that it can be harnessed for good. We all have the potential to do great work. But in too many cases, if there's no discipline, I think we're just left unmanageable, unfocused, and discontent. A sacred workplace is going to take hard work, passion, dreams to discipline, controlled strength. Second thought in this area. You know, I've interviewed a lot of people over the years. And the one thing I always sort of smirk at is during the interview process, if I'm interviewing, let's say, a guy, and, you know, we're talking, and he goes, you know, I'm a big picture person. Yeah, I'm more the, the, the big picture guy. You know, I'm not really the detailed guy. I'm a, I'm a big picture guy. I'm a visionary guy. You get me a few detailed people around me and look out because I'm a big picture guy. You know, sometimes what I think in my mind you're really saying is you don't want to do any work. Right? You, you just want to, you know, translate that into, I'm going to sit around and I'm not really going to do anything. Folks, there's people that are naturally detailed people. They, they thrive in the details. And I know that there are some people that are definitely more visionary. But let me tell you something that life has taught me. When you care about something, you are detailed. You are detailed about the things you care about the most. If you're dating someone that you really, really like, and at this point she still has other options, you're detailed. You remember what she likes. You remember where she wants to go to eat. You remember. Don't you want people that serve you in your life to care about details? Don't you want your kids' teachers to be detailed? Don't you want your bus driver or your airplane pilot to be detailed? I want my eye doctor to be detailed. I want the guy working on my car to be detailed. I want my waiter and waitress to be detailed. I don't want my waiter coming over with me the food and saying, you know, sorry, man, I'm a big picture guy. <laughs> I know you wanted some food, but I forgot what exactly you wanted, so I just brought you a Cobb salad. Is that okay? 
Are you paying attention to the details at whatever it is that you call work in this season of life? Details at work, they let your boss, your classmates, your peers, your children, or your customers know that this is important to you. And the Bible is packed with details from God. Go look at the building of the ark and see the detailed list that Noah was given by God. The tabernacle with its incredibly detailed dimensions and this temple. Go look at the list of detailed materials that God put in place for this temple construction. Details matter to God. Details are an open door for your work to become a sacred place. Now see, if, if I take the scripture out of everything that I just said right now, what I've just preached, I, I could give that talk in any high school, college, you know, or motivational seminar. Because see, whether you're a believer or not in Christ, I believe that the, the discipline and detail will truly help you from becoming your own worst enemy at work. But my last point won't fly in the secular setting. Real work finds its purpose when it serves others and reflects Christ. That temple, if you know your, your Old Testament history, it was built. It was unbelievable. Kings and queens traveled from far lands just to look at it. But if you know your church history, God's people turned from him. They continually became their own worst enemy. Their stubbornness and their dogged determination to do what they wanted to do led God to allow that temple to be overrun eventually, looted, and turned to rubble. And years later, Nehemiah and a fellow named Zerubbabel returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the city walls and to rebuild the temple. And in Haggai 2, verse 4, they're rebuilding this once splendid temple. And it says that it's not going well. And Haggai, this prophet from God, is imploring the people to focus. He says this, work. He's speaking on behalf of God. For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. He's trying to encourage them. This project is completely off track. Why? If you go back to Ezra, it gives a description of what's going on doing the rebuilding of this temple. And it says this, Ezra 3, verse 12. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house or the first temple, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, this new temple, as it was being constructed. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. What's going on here? Those that saw the original temple in all of its splendor and glory knew that this one wasn't going to be that. that. They were miserable, it says, whining, weeping as they watched this much smaller temple be laid. Th th this rough shot, almost a shack compared to the original temple. And work was not going well. And God speaks to them through the prophet Haggai in verse 9 of that chapter 2. Now listen to this, and leave this up for a couple minutes, folks, so that you can just sort of grab it. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. God says that this new temple will be greater than the one Solomon built. Peace will emerge from this place. How? Because 400 years later or so, Jesus Christ is going to be dedicated in that temple. 
he's going to stroll in there as an adult and he's going to chase some money changers out. He's going to teach there and his light is going to shine in that place. He is going to die on a cross on a hill above that temple and a curtain upon his death is going to be torn in two in that temple and we are going to be able to engage in the presence of God because of that separation being gone. Maybe where you're working right now is not what you had hoped for. Maybe you are miserable and you look around and you say, man, this is just, Scott, you don't get it. This isn't, this isn't anything what I dreamed of. Can I remind you that as a believer, you are called to serve others and reflect Christ at your work. You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that you could walk into it. Maybe you are exactly where God wants you to be so that you can reflect his light and bring peace to those around you. I want to close with a tough sort of statement. If you're miserable at work, and because of it, you become completely undisciplined, careless, lazy, or sloppy, or, or maybe you're straddling that ethical fence choosing to do something that maybe isn't morally upright. Can I ask you to please do one thing? Don't tell anybody you're a Christian. Because I think you'll give Christianity a bad name. Because no matter what your present situation at work is, there is one true thing that trumps everything. You have the privilege to serve and to reflect Christ no matter what season, no matter where you're at in work, no matter what you're doing to all those that labor with you. Maybe God has placed you there for that specific reason. Allow discipline to be your expression of passion. Let detail be the expression of your vision. And then serve others where you work and reflect Christ. And your labor can become a sacred place. I really believe that. Why don't you stand up with me?